Hey everybody, it's Prince for Life. This is the one the only Brad. How are you guys doing today? I hope you're all doing well. I have a special guest today. Uh, I have the one the only Ron Garney. How are you doing, Ron? Can you guys see me? Yes, they can. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm doing uh, good. How are you? Uh, I don't know yet. Well, we got a live chat going, so once they pop in, start popping in here, we'll uh, we'll get some. Nobody's there. No, Tyler is in the chat right now. I was talking to him earlier. Uh, I know. Can I go uh, to YouTube and see this. Or you not? totally can. Yeah. Um, so. Where do I? Yeah. Go? Oh, uh, let me. I'll put the. I'll send you the link. Or it's just it's pencil for life, just like my Twitter handle on YouTube. So. Yeah. Anyways, how are you doing today, Ron? I'm doing good. Awesome. Uh, Justin's in the chat. He says, hey. There, uh, I gotcha. 656 Comics are in the house. These Ooh, guys are great. Well, you have to that. mute me, by the way. Awesome. On the YouTube channel. Justin's in the chat. He says, hey. There, uh, I gotcha. There you go. Six <laughs> Comics are in the house. <laughs> These guys are great. Well, what was that? Me, by the way. Awesome. On the YouTube channel. Justin's in the chat. He says, hey. There Ron, you, you got to mute that, buddy. There you go. Six Comics are in the house. These guys are great. Uh, what was that? Ron? Ron, you got to mute like that, eight different Yeah, 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 you got to mute the YouTube channel. What do I have to do? Mute the YouTube channel. Ron? Ron, you got to mute that, like eight different Okay, now. There you go. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Google does not, yeah, Google hates that, by the way. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You can still see the chat, though, so... Uh, uh, when it comes up. So 656 Comics are in the house. They're independent comic guys from El Paso. They're great guys. Rise Leeds from Australia. Uh, he's a good dude. And uh, Mangle Shanks in the house. So awesome, guys. Thanks for joining us today, by the way. Uh, uh, sorry for the brief start. Yeah. For them. Uh, them too. Yeah. I, I got to try to, you know, play both of you here. <laughs> but uh, Ron, um, one – uh, honestly, thanks for joining me today. Uh, I wasn't uh, wasn't expecting that you actually would. I was quite surprised when you said yes. So why? Uh, you oh, I've messaged so many people, you know, trying to get them on there. It's hard, you know, uh, sometimes for guys to, you know, share what it's like to draw comics and work in the industry and stuff like that. So I don't mind. I, you know, I, I'm a social butterfly. What can there I you go. There you go, social butterfly you are. <laughs> so, Ron, um, let's let's start with the basics. How did you get started into comics? Uh, Lord have mercy, that's a long story. But um, we got time. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I started. Well, obviously, like most, I read comics when I was little. Mm -hmm. uh, I kind of grew out of them. I um, got into other things like music and sports and. You know, girls, and then I got to college, and um, then right after college, my last year, I was working as a bartender at a at a restaurant bar, and um, wasn't sure what I was going to do after college. And then um, the, one of the bartenders had a Secret Wars comic mm -hmm. reading, and he let me see it, and I was like, "Oh, this is really cool!" And um, I knew I wanted, I liked the idea of filmmaking, photography, and I was an artist, and you know, and it seemed to check all those boxes, uh, you know, because of the compositions, the storytelling was, you know, it's, you know, it's sort of like uh, <laughs> doing storyboards in a way. Um, yeah, it's a different really, way to you know, story. I the whole idea of storytelling. So anyway, I kind of got really reinterested right away, and I went down to the store he got the comic from, and I got a bunch of comics to read, and I kind of got hooked right away, and I started reading. Uh, old um let's say it was reading miller and uh john byrne and mm -hmm. i think uh one of the first ones i picked up was a john byrne comic called season of the witch or night of the witch or something like that and the ff word living secret identities in, in connecticut and uh it was just fascinating to me i just i just really got into it and so um i thought oh, i could actually do this i could you know this is something i could pursue and I talked to the guy at the store about it, and he said there was a Marvel tryout contest 
in a book they were having and he pointed it out to me and I entered that. Didn't win. I think Mark Bagley won. And Mark, I believe Mark did win. Yeah, Mark Bagley won it. And um, so, but, you know, it lit a fire under me because when I was growing up, I was always pretty good at art and drawing or whatever and uh, yeah. it lit a fire under me to keep pursuing it. You know, even though I didn't win, I, it made me want to pursue it even more, you know, the challenge of getting in. And so that's what happened. And I found out that um, the guy who drew Secret Wars, that Secret Wars comic, my exec, just out of dumb luck, happened to live right down the road from where I lived. Really? Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah it was bizarre. Um, somebody told me, said, yeah, that guy, my exec, lives in West Haven. And I was right there in Westville, which is – the next town over, you know, mm. the same road. And um, so I looked it up in the phone book and there was his name. I'm like, holy, you know, holy crap, that it was Mike Zek. And so I called him up and left him a message. I wouldn't suggest anyone else do things like that. <laughs> but yeah. at that time, you know, there were still phone books and, you know, it was before. And you look people up normally and, yeah. yeah. So I called him up and he called me back and said, sure, send me your stuff. And, so I did, and he called me back, and he gave me a critique over the phone, and uh, he seemed to think I was pretty good. So he came down to my bar, I was bartending, and we started hanging out a little bit, and he asked me to uh, if I wanted to go play volleyball, I think, or go to a convention. And that's really kind of where it began. And then I worked up some samples, uh, which he helped me out on, make sure they were good and ready, and then we went into Marvel, and I got a job from Marvel in D.C. that day. You know, DC really? First. God, yeah. I wish it was that way today. Yeah, well, I had been practicing before I even might, met Mike. I had been practicing drawing, you know, for a bit. Um, but then after I met him, between the time I met him and got in, it was a couple of years. So I was mm -hmm. really determined. I kept drawing and drawing and drawing and drawing working up samples, the same samples over and over again to the point of lunacy. So uh, by the time I went in, I was pretty ready, I think. And um, yeah, so I got home. Um, DC offered me an Animal Man, the uh, Animal Man book, and uh, Grant Morrison was writing that. Cool. But I did eight pages of it, and then the guy who they originally asked before I came on changed his mind, said he wanted to do it. Uh, so... They bought my eight pages, and uh, so then I just went with what Marvel offered, which was, I, I think it was G.I. Joe. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how it began, really. So Cool. But it was pretty bizarre that it was Zek, you know, that it was his was the comic I picked up, and then he turned out to live down the road, and he brought me in. <laughs> uh, well, it's funny, it's a uh, very similar story uh, in my – not too far from me, uh, Sal Valuto lives out here. Oh, yeah, I know Sal. I remember I loved his Moon Knight stuff. Yeah, he did, you know, Moon Knight, Power Pack, and, you know, uh, Black Panther. And uh, yeah, he, uh, he found it. Adam's influenced. Yes, yes. He uh, he found me working at, uh, uh, I was working at a data center, just sketching. And his guy who runs the servers found me over there. And, uh, so, hey, you should meet Sal, you know, and so Sal's kind of been my mentor. And so mm -hmm. I, inked, you know, some of his uh, Black Panther stuff, uh, not Black Panther, uh, his uh, Phantom stuff that he does overseas right now and uh, things like that. And so he kind of got me started towards this career that I've always kind of wanted to do anyway. So well, that's cool. Yeah. I see we both have our guys that we totally. Yeah. Uh, Muttman in the chat would like to know what is your favorite, the most favorite comic book you've ever worked on? Uh, hey, Muttman. Um, he's my favorite. You know, it's it's funny because as I finish each one, they're they're sort of my favorite at the time. I'd say mm -hmm. I know my least favorites, but I would have to say at this point, probably Daredevil. Really? Okay. Um, what I did with Charles Soule. Um, That's uh. I just Justin, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say in the chat, Justin was saying your uh, Charles Soul Daredevil run was his first uh, Daredevil run book he he ever got. So oh, yeah. okay, I, okay, yeah. Thank you for the compliment. Um, Evolution Arts, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, I 
Yeah, I really enjoyed doing it. One, it was I had done Men of Wrath right before that, um, which was a creator owned. Mm -hmm. But I was really getting into the, you know, just inking my own work. And then I, when they offered me Daredevil, I had an instant sort of vision in my head of how I wanted to look, ink wise and color wise. So I had a lot of, um, I really pushed for a lot of creative control on that. Worked very closely with the colorist on it. Uh, to give it a real different look than anything that was on the stands. And I kind of wanted the reader when they opened it up and looked at the coloring work and the ink work to, yeah. you know, look like they were looking through, through Matt's eyes, sort of radar-y, you know, just something different. I'm going to pull up some of the artwork right now, actually. So okay. while we're talking, yeah. Yeah, cool. So I, I think I got a couple of pieces here uh, from yeah. Daredevil. Tony, uh, my other favorite. Yeah. And uh, where's there we go, Daredevil, right there. I love so I love I love the way you use uh, your black and whites to uh, really make them stand out in the scene. Uh, yeah, it was difficult to work on the coloring for that, you know, because the black and whites work in a certain way where you're leaving lines off. Like I deliberately leave lines off. To let the mind trick the mind's eye into to filling the form in on its own. Yeah, you have to be very careful with the color because that can kind of thwart that whole idea. So a lot of my stuff is really kind of looks can be a little bit more interesting if you just see it in black and white. Mm -hmm. but I wanted the coloring to have a really unique, interesting look. Like that that splash page, mm -hmm. um, I can't show you, but that that splash page originally looked very traditionally colored. Like had a you know blue sky with sunset you know and and I it just wasn't satisfactory to me I wanted it to be different you know so we put the the texture on with the dots and um, and and did a monochromatic feel because I wanted it to feel like Daredevil's eyes looking at it you know, I, okay I get you yeah see uh, I I appreciate your art style the most because I'm colorblind you know so are you uh, really yeah I'm red green colorblind uh, so I will usually work in tones. Which is why you know I put you on that top ten list of you know my favorite artists. You know, I love the way you use your line work. Uh, I love the way it looks. It stands out to me, create you know really crazy like, and uh, I just like how you do it. The energy, the motion. Uh, you don't seem to over black things. You do it just enough. You don't black them enough. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Six, six five six in the comics uh, or six five six comics uh, says Ron's run on Night Stalkers was our jam. Those were the first comics we read back in the day. Uh, so cool. Yeah, I can see that? Thank you. Uh, Muttman asks, uh, "Who do you think colors your work the best?" Oh, jeez, you're gonna get me in trouble if I answer that. No, nah, you're you're totally fine. Secrets uh, I, between I, us. I enjoy all of them for different reasons. I mean, I was, um, you know. I, I liked working with Matt and Matt Mella on Daredevil. He's great um, because we had a very, we have and had a, a very close relationship because I worked with him on amazing Spider-Man as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And so for this, he was very open to my ideas and really pushed himself to come up with, you know, a really unique look uh, along with me f for this book. And so I always appreciated that professionalism and how what a talent he is. So he's great. I love working with Richard Eisenhoff on uh, the Conan stuff. Mm -hmm. He's great. I mean, uh, all these guys, but uh, you know, these guys are all great. Uh, Marta Gracia, even for a short run on X Force, was great. You know, it's definitely a safe favorite. With with doing a, a heavy black and white style, how do you? Uh, um, how do you tell the colorist what you're looking for on the page or do you just let them go wild? Um, usually like I'll make suggestions, but w what happens is, is I'll send the pages and then they come back with their, like originally with on, on daredevil, I um, sent him all kinds of coloring ideas, like uh, some Andy Warhol, a lot of black and white photography with splashes of, neonish color on it um you know just to give him inspiration for where i wanted it to, it to go and then he would send back some colors and then i would just 
basically go over them with them and tell them what I thought worked and what didn't. And, you know, um, so we got to what we both liked, you know, mm -hmm. that's how it worked. Work it's like with Richard. The piece I have pulled up right now, you know, you did the thing with the tones in the background again, and we mainly just see the the red that really stands out. Yes. And, you know, because I personally, what I was saying. that's a good example of what I was saying when I had sent the black and white photos and flashes of red and neon things, you know, just to make it noir and then just have the, the red be the, you know, or the color be the focus, an intense focus. Okay. So you want the color just mainly on Daredevil himself, because I I probably would have went a step farther and put the red and the stripes on the on the flag as well. But well, if you look at it, it is. It's just a really dark value of red. Is it? Oh. The lights, you know, the lights hitting it at a different angle. It's not black. It looks like it is, but if you really look at it close, it's a very 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 dark value of red. Huh. My eyes can't see it. Uh, right. You said your color. Yeah. Yeah. So. It was the yeah. same with Richard Eisenhoff, you know, when we started on Conan, you know, I wanted something a little more European on that book to, you know, to match the kind of penciling I was doing on it, plus the, you know, the old world that Conan inhabits. So mm -hmm. you know, I asked him if he could do something more watercolory, and he actually went to town and started doing blue lines of the, of the work or, or working off of a scan and coloring it on, on paper. Um, and then reskin, coloring it in, in uh, you know, on the computer. So it was a nice effect. Yeah, uh, I pulled up the cover for. Uh, I think this is issue one or two. Let's... That's uh, the first one. I have that yeah. original. Oh, you have the original? Oh God, hell yeah! I want to see that. Now, if you want to show any more original artwork, there we don't. We do not mind at all. So. Some of this over. Heck yeah, baby. Uh, I'm all about the original artwork. I love original artwork from from artists. So yeah, some of the stuff, like most of the interiors I'm, I'm doing digitally, but the covers I'll do um, you know, I do normal, you know, mm -hmm. console style because uh, so. Yeah, my friend Chad Harding does the same thing, like certain covers or pinup pages. He'll do traditional, and then, oh, dude, that's so good. Yeah, uh, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, just, I don't want to, um, you know, I want to have some things in hand, so I, I tend to do mm -hmm. the covers, a lot of the covers. Like, I have some of the Daredevil covers. Let's see if I can pull these up. Oh, please, yeah. I'm sure the audience would love to see it. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Risey says uh, he was looking at some of your work, uh, Ron. He loved your juggernaut. That, uh, the, and he used to have the uncanny X-Men issues that you worked on. Oh, yeah. The juggernaut. Uh, piece Mutt, of it. Mutt Man was saying, uh, I loved your art on Hulk. Uh, when I first discovered it, Captain America number two cover seemed uh, to be a new style with your artwork. Uh, is there a moment you can point to where your style changed? Here's that cover that you were just. You were oh, okay. Just... Oh, that's so nice, dude. So I'm sorry. What was the question again? My style changed when uh, I did... Captain America number two. Your the cover seemed your your art style seemed to change a little bit. This is Cap when we came back. Wade and I. Uh, I'm not too sure on which one he's talking about. If you could be a little more specific, my man, we'd, we'd, uh... Captain America. I've done, I did a lot of cap. Yeah, I did the first run, which was um, for forty-four. I think it started, mm -hmm. and then uh, it went to Liefeld and those guys, and then it came back, and we started with Captain America number one. So maybe that's what he's talking about with the submarine. Maybe. Um, I don't know, my man's, you know, he probably got in his comics about the same time I did, so probably what around that time. Cover? Was it the, the one where the shield is? Uh, we're just waiting for a reply for him still. Uh, in the meantime, oh, the shield with bullets ricocheting everywhere. Right. Yes, okay, I, yeah, I remember that cover. Where he's charging in from the right or the left. Well, he's crouched down and he's, yeah, yeah. you know, there's a girl behind him. 
and he's covering up, covering them both up with the shield, and you just see the bullet design, mm-hmm. you know, ricocheting around the submarine. That's the number two I think I remember. That's what he's talking about. <laughs> uh, my friend Jess Smart Smiley. Uh, by the way, Jess, you're an awesome dude. Stay positive. He, he says a sickness. He's bedridden for right now. So, oh, uh, uh, no, he's a cool dude. He makes children's books, actually. Uh, but he is asking, what is your favorite inking technique? Um, hmm. My favorite inking technique. Or how do you normally ink, I should say? Um, like anybody else, <laughs> I mean, I, use, I just do a, a pencil drawing and then I, um, you know, I start out drawing over with the ink. Maybe I start with a pen and then I just build it up and then the areas I want, um, white it out. I'll use white out or I work all that out in the pencil. I can erase the areas I, you know, I want to take out to get that black and white effect. Do you ever use masking fluid? Uh, yeah, sometimes. I, I normally use whiteout pens. You know, mm-hmm. you know, make energetic slashes with them yeah. or get in a little tighter. But once in a while, I've used the fluid. Cool. Uh, <laughs> what do you start with your your major blacks first, and then you do all the detail work, or do you leave your major blacks for for later in case you want to change them? You know, uh, the, hard, the hardcore shadows. I do all the big blacks at the end. Oh, okay. I do everything. I delineate everything first. And then I, you know, and then I go over with the big solid blacks after. And then I build up the line weights. Oh, okay. I, you know, it becomes a, an artistic process because you do the pencils, no matter how, how tight you are in the pencils, most of the time, once you lay ink over it, you see things that need to change. Mm-hmm. And then if you erase the pencil out from underneath the ink, it tends to get much thinner <clears throat> and that's why you need to, you know, beef it all up with a brush or, you know, or another pen or something like that. Do you, do you use a brush or a quill or what do you use? Um, I use technical pens and I, I use brushes, the Windsor Newton series seven. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes to fill in the big blacks, I'll even use, you know, a Copic marker if I have to. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, here's a, uh, you know, here's just a, a standard white up, white up. Okay. A lot of times what I like to use are these calligraphy pens. Like this oh. is a calligraphy pen, and you can it, – what's good about it is you can get a thin and then just twist your wrist, and then it makes a nice, chunky, thick angle um, to the line weight, which is, you know, really effective, and it saves you time from having to go over with a brush. You do the same thing with a brush. By applying pressure, you do a nice thin line, yeah. apply a little more pressure and change the angle and chop it down. A little. But this does it a little bit easier. So yeah. they use that, but they run out of ink quick. So <laughs> I resort back to that. Uh, Jess had one more question. Can you beat Liefeld in an arm wrestling match? Yeah, I spotted that when I was waiting for you to get to that. <laughs> I think so. I hope so. He is a skinny dude. So I haven't seen. Rob in God knows how many years. I can't remember the last time I saw him. So uh, I'm, I'm a really big, tall guy, right? I'm a big, fat guy. And uh, I got to meet Jim, Jim Lee in January. He was uh, out here doing a signing. I had no idea how small of a man he is. And uh, and I, w- I was waiting in line. And I had my back to him. I had no idea. I just said, this, excuse me. And I turned around like, oh, Mr. Lee. And he was so tiny. And I felt like it was going to break him when I was shaking his hand. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, he's not a huge guy. But <laughs> no, no, yeah. He reminds me of this story. made me think of him. Because I was at the New York Con last year. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was 2 o'clock in the morning. I was trying to get some sleep because I had to get up early, you know, finish my uh, commissions and everything and then get to the con. And some somebody was blasting uh, rap hip-hop music right through the wall next to me while I was trying to sleep. And it went, this went on until like four o'clock in the morning. But before that, I went over, I rapped on the door, like banging on the door. And I'm like, cause you know, it was really getting on my nerves cause I couldn't sleep. So the door opens and I am expecting some, you know, it just, it was this small guy who looked just like Jim Lee. 
<laughs> he's like, oh, sorry, bro. Sorry, sorry. I'm like, thank you. Do you mind? I'm trying to sleep. But it just was funny because I, I felt like it would have been hilarious if it was Jim. By I don't see him listening to rap. You know, I, I just don't. I don't know what he listens to. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't either. But he's a good guy. I, I haven't, you know, I haven't talked to him a little bit. But he's a good dude. Cool. Uh, what? Uh, so I know you worked at you know Marvel a lot. You've done some DC work with like JLA and uh, yeah. Animal Man, things like that. Uh, if you could choose any title you you wanted to draw, and you get to do your own story, kind of like Sean Gordon Murphy does, what would you choose? What character would you choose to do? Oh, jeez. Um, you could do a team. You could do you know a couple of characters. I'm not a team book guy. Okay. Really not, you know, I. Um, one thing about me is I don't enjoy doing team books because what I do like, what keeps me really interested are the single characters that I can apply an artistic style to. Like if you notice my surfer is vastly different from my daredevil. Um, and that's a lot of that is because of me always experimenting and growing and changing. I have a surfer actually that you did. I'm yeah. just trying to, try to find it real quick. There he is. Yeah. Yeah. That came out pretty nice. I think. Yeah, uh, I like it. So, yeah, so it's, you know, I changed my style up a lot. But as far as me writing and drawing, and you know, I mean, it's that's a tough question. I don't know. Um, maybe uh, my own characters, probably. I don't know if it would be any, anything that Marvel owns or, or DC owns. Mm -hmm. Now, I... The art, the artwork I picked, you know, for for today's interview, was stuff I always found appealing Instagram. of your stuff. Yeah, yeah. So it was from Instagram. So it was from Twitter. You know, things like that. But that I, was, re I that really was, like this cap. Yeah, that cap was uh, basically from the Spider Man issue I did. Now I had um, in the Spider Man issue, he's giving Peter Parker a lecture, a speech there. Mm -hmm. Um, about no, you move. When somebody says move, you say no, you move. That kind of speech. And uh, mm -hmm. I had a, a rough draft of that page before I had finished it. And so I just went in and just jazzed it all up and put it on Instagram as a separate sketch. So it came out. Okay. Yeah, I like how you use the white, uh, you know, as the. Yeah, it's an effective contrast. I think it adds impact and, you know, really helps pull out the form a lot. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I have fun with that. Uh, you know who, who I think you'd be great at is the question. I think yeah, the guy with no face. Yeah, dude, but he's like that detective look. You got the cars. You got that. Yeah, uh, you got that nice stark style. I think that would work well with your. That'd be easy your to style. for sure. Wouldn't have to draw his face at all. <laughs> be a little easier, but it's also a little more difficult too when you draw the question because you got you got to figure out how to do the emotions of what he's going through, you know? So, uh, this Dr. Strange, I like this one too. Um, it's pretty cool. Uh, it kind of reminds me of you cross with a little bit of Wills Portacio. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, I can see that. yeah. Mainly because of the hair and the face, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I really like it. And then, uh, let's see what else do I pick out here? Oh yes. This was a great one you did. Yeah. Thor and Malekith. Actually, I just got asked to do a bookend to that cover where Thor is victorious. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, so I may do that um, or any character, but something similar to that one. Mm -hmm. And this is all digital, correct? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. That digital. Digital. Yeah. You can tell by the grays and everything. I really yeah. want the grays on that one. Do colors have it easier when they do uh, straight black and white pages or do they have it easier when you, put the grays in there so they can just color over the value. Um, well, it's easier for them if you leave it as a layer um, mm -hmm. so they can manipulate the opacity if they need to. Oh, gotcha. You know, I've only recently been doing that since Daredevil. Well, Men of Wrath, I was doing it on. Because it's like, you know, back even when I, before I was inking my own stuff, you really leave yourself open to uh, – you know, live or die under someone else's, you know, work if you're not careful. So I, 
I'm doing a lot for me, you know, I have to be happy with it at the end of the day. So I'm doing a lot more gray work, mm -hmm. gray detail work too. So I can be happy with the way I think it should look. And, and I, I think ultimately it helps the colorist because they don't have to, you know, question where you want to go with it, you know? Yeah. With the lightings, the tones. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I think it definitely helps them. Okay. Uh, Muttman would like to know, oh, go ahead. Uh, Muttman was asking, can you talk a little about a little bit more about working on cap and what it was like for you? So uh, Muttman, let's say, see, see mighty geek. Hey, Hey, mighty geek. K blonde, risey Lee. Uh, yep. I bloody love Vic Sage. I don't know who that is. <laughs> okay. So it says, I love Ron's Captain America is real Patriot. Mm -hmm through can you talk about working in cab is that the question yeah that's the one yeah okay. um yeah i when i first got offered cap way back um I, it was an instant yes for me like it took me all two seconds to say oh yeah because he was one of those characters that i had done i had done a lot of dark characters right before that before i did cap i did night stalkers moon knight um a little bit of daredevil um Ghost Rider, you know, it was all dark stuff. And I had originally wanted to get into comics so I could do like Superman. And my samples to get into Marvel were Captain America samples. So I fancy oh. myself more of a superhero, like Cap sort of artist. That's what I kind of wanted to do. But I was obviously willing to, to take on, you know, what was offered me at the time, you know, which was Ghost Rider and Moon Knight and those. Those characters, you know, I had just started, so I felt like I had to pay my dues. So I was, you know, I wasn't going to say no. Um, mm -hmm. So by the time Cap came around, I was really ecstatic, and I had an instant vision in my head how I wanted the book to look. And actually, the the font for Captain America with the shield streaking through was my idea. My oh, know, nice. Um, I I look, I designed art, you know, I penciled the way I wanted the logo to look, and then I think it was. Uh, Todd Klein he came up with a font for it. And um, so I really had fun because I, I was able to artistically sort of direct the entire look and revamp of that, that book. Um, no, is this volume that's three? Why, you know, that's why it was even more of a shame when it got taken away, ultimately, after nine issues or so. I forgot how many issues it was because, you know, we were so inspired, or at least I was so artistically inspired. And, the stories were great. Um, you know, I worked with Mark Wade initially. And uh, the first time I met him, we talked about where we thought the book could go. And I said some at that time, True Lies had come out. Mm -hmm. um, and I liked that movie. It was an action movie. And I thought it would be a great idea to have Cap sort of disappear out of the country and, you know, see how the rest of the world would treat Captain America. Because I love adventure stuff. Mm hmm I wanted it to feel like that, like Cap goes on these adventures to, you know, these spy adventures or something, you know, rather than it just be, um, you know, set in America. So that's really how the whole Man Without a Country storyline sort of evolved. And, um, you know, things from that point on, like the Japan issue, when we came back around, all that was sort of loosely based on these conversations I had had with Mark and his own visions of it too, you know, um, so. So, yeah, so that's where it went. And I loved always giving him an iconic feel. Every time, artistically, I wanted every time you look at Cap to always feel that sort of somebody you could admire, you know, like, and there's not enough of that, you know. I think, you know, um, I'm going to say maybe a father figure, or but just somebody you could, who's a real hero that, you know, is steadfast and 100% committed to his ideals. Mm-hmm. And so I always liked that idea with, with that character. And I tried to, in a quick visual, always exude that about him. So whether it be his chin up, or I remember there was a double spread I did of him fighting these guys um, at the end of the last issue we I did with Mark. Um, you know, and helicopters coming in, and he's fighting all these guys, but it's just very majestic, you know, um, rather than it just be a, standard fight scene. I wanted to feel like this is what Captain America is all about. Yeah, I get that. that when you're showing his ultimate cap where he was. Yeah. 
the other universe who's more of a son of a bitch. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, you did Sentinels of Liberty too, right? Yes, I did. And yes. you wrote that one, correct? I yeah, I, I co-plotted it with Mark. Um, okay. You know, with ideas and stuff, but I, you know, ultimately it was more Mark than me. You know, um, that's true. But that was more. That was more of a consolation prize because they took the main book away from me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, to be honest, it wasn't a lot of fun. Um, you know, we came back after all that, after all was said and done. At that time, Marvel was very um, chaotic, I would say, you know. Um, and, and so it was my career. I uh, was up and down. It was all over the place because I was on books and taking out books. And do you want to do this? And so it was, you know, all within the span of a couple of years. I did Hulk, Surfer, App, Sentinel of Liberty, you know. Yeah over a few years because uh, of the chaos there was that that was because uh was that because of the few years after you know image started and everything was kind of going crazy uh you know uh um, was, yeah you know, it was the bankruptcy you know marvel went through bankruptcy and yeah okay was, is that, you know you remember how the industry was it, it exploded um because of the um you know multiple copies and mm -hmm. like that it started because of baseball cards and, and things like, you know, so the collector market, speculator market really took off. And so once Spider-Man, Todd McFarlane, Spider-Man jumped and, and became like the biggest selling thing, then everything, you know, became like that. They were looking for the next big uh, money maker, which was X-Men that sold seven and a half million copies. So yeah. I think stockholders and everything were desperate to keep that going. And uh, you can't. It's a you know. It's a, it's it's not. A, it's a house built on toothpicks at that point. Yeah. So um, that's basically what happened. Once the sales started tanking, you know, and the, the collectors and speculators got wise to it, they stopped picking up all those copies, and and the stores started. You know, were backfilled with all these, you know, polybag comics and gimmicks and things they couldn't get rid of. Mm -hmm. So you know the story, just to tank the industry. So oh, yeah. Here, here's a good question: Did you make more money back then in the '90s when it was booming than today? Hmm. Like your page rate, royalties, or page rate, your page rates. Because I know back then, a lot of guys were getting paid really big bucks for page rates. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I would say I I paid comparably comparably, you know, to what I made back then. I'm not going to give numbers, but oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, you know, the the royalties were were certainly good during that boom. I, I can't lie about that. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I went through a real down time down period in my career, and had to and slowly kind of built it back up to you know where you know. I'm having some success now, mm -hmm. um, but you know, it was a, a while. Um, so my page rate actually went down for a long time. Did uh, it? Okay. Yeah, I was making a lot less, particularly when I went to DC. Um, DC wasn't offering a whole lot. Um, I took a page cut, page rate cut to go over there. And I, you know, but there was a lot of stuff going on in my personal life back then. And see, that's one of the runs I, wasn't happy with the X Men, uh, the X -Men one. Yeah. Oh. Let me show that to everybody real quick. It's just, uh, it's just, I can't even look at it. <laughs> <laughs> it yeah. does, it, it definitely does not seem like your your normal style. No, uh, well, uh, you know, I mean, a, a lot of it has to do with the inkers and the colorists and things like yeah. that. I mean, as far as how it ends up looking, but it was just that was during a period where things in my personal life were starting to tank, and I wasn't mm -hmm. putting. You know the work in that I probably needed to work and to, to put in. Um, so luckily, you know, I, things got better, and uh, you know, and my work got better. So, uh, Mutt says, uh, "Why have you committed your career to comics as opposed to any other uh, other artistic fields?" <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Um, He's a writer, so he has lots of good questions. Started out being a fantasy illustrator. Like I had all these paintings I had done in college and 
fine art paintings and um i was also always into sports and music and you know comics just sort of happened i mean i pursued it once i discovered the comic books at the bar that time and then it just sort of kept going um you know i was doing local work for magazines and things like that but then once i got the first job in comics um it just kept going from there and it's one of those things you before you know it you've got 10 years under your belt and you just keep going you know mm -hmm. I, I like doing it it's been good to me i've traveled the world um you know i've gotten to meet wonderful people um so there's lots of great things about it that kept me going you know even through the downtime mm -hmm. that's basically why you know it's a good career to have yeah. now i've noticed some of your pencil work uh like uh when you do your covers and things like that it's very very loose you don't fill in like solid a lot of uh uh like a lot of artists will like go to the sections where they need the dark blacks and put the x's and stuff uh, like on this cover here, you just left a lot of lines uh, instead of actually, you know, like drawing feathers or doing hard shadows and stuff like that. I was wondering why you do it that way. Um, well, that was at a time when I was just having my pencils colored. Mm -hmm. I would say I would go extra tight and fine with the lines. I mean, that's a fairly tight. Um, so I would put that in and then I would, I would adjust it on the, uh, in Photoshop and make it look inked. Um, and I was experimenting with that because I always loved the colored pencil look in a comic book. I think it's a sort of, there's something there that when it's done right, it's mm -hmm. like it. I think it's cool. Oh, I agree. I agree. Absolutely gorgeous. And so I was experimenting a lot with that back then and, coming up with those, trying to come up with pastel tones and stuff. And sometimes it was a success. And the problem is, is it's the best of times, the worst of times. If you're not tight or you're not doing it just right, it can look like a disaster. And there were pages when I'm under the, <clears throat> under the deadline gun and you have to get it done because, you know, the editor's breathing down your neck. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, it takes, you can't put the extra time in that it needs to get that special look to it. So like I said, when it was great, it was, I loved it and it wasn't so great, you know, it wasn't so great. But there's some stuff I did in Thor where it was the scan pencils and I just love the way it looks. Mm. You know, so. uh, if you can create your own comic, this is from Mighty Geek Studios. If you can create your own, own comic, what type of story do you think you'd do? Um, I love science fiction, um, you know, mixed with philosophy, so something like that. Yeah. Do you have any sci-fi art? Because I've never, I don't think I've seen a lot of your sci-fi art. Sci-fi art? I have a lot in my sketchbooks. Oh, okay. I, have, um, I don't have, I haven't done anything real sci-fi in comics, which I'd like to do. Uh, you know, that's what I always liked about Mobius's work. He did some, just the greatest, you know, sci-fi scapes and things. And mm -hmm. I always wanted to sort of tap into that. That's probably why I'm drawn to the surfer. Because it's the character that's closest to sci-fi that you're going to get, really, in the Marvel universe. Well, yeah, Darth yeah, Vader. Yeah, well, that's Star Wars, but I'm, I'm talking about Marvel characters. Oh, just Marvel characters. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, say Surfer is sci-fi to me, you know. But with Surfer, I would love to do a combination of sci-fi fantasy. You know, I have a story idea about Surfer with this, this huge uh, fire-breathing dragon that I wanted to do. Uh -huh. um, that someday maybe I'll get around to doing, but I never, I've just never gotten around to it. So, that's true. Uh, Muttman has another good question. What characters or stories inspired you uh, when you first got into comics? Besides uh, Secret Wars, I think it was or Secret. Yeah, when I when I was growing up, I read a lot of the same ones you guys might have. Um, mm -hmm. Fantastic Four. I remember I had and Superman. I had. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to think. One of the first comics I had was The Thing versus the Hulk on the GW Bridge in the FF. I mean, I just remember the things that stick out in your brain. I remember The Thing wrapping one of the girders, the big steel girders around the Hulk and holding it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that one. Yeah. She put against it and holding it. And I remember just 
being so amazed at the art and, and how Kirby really, you felt the mitts of the thing holding on to that thing and he was straining and the Hulk just kept getting angrier and the, the thing was getting desperate because he couldn't hold him. No, he can't. Yeah. Always stuck out in my head, you know, things like that. And um, But I also read, there was a lot, I mean, where I grew up, I wasn't near, you know, they weren't comic shops like there are now. And, you know, you have to, I'd have to drive a half hour to get, because you know, I lived out in the country, um, to get comics. But the ones I did get weren't always Marvel. They were uh, gold key comics, things like Rat Magnus, Robot Fighter, mm -hmm. um, things like that. Um, you know, I do remember seeing Iron Man, having Iron Man comics growing up. Um, yeah, so all those, um, and then even there were Spidey super stories, and it was with the Electric Company. It was like Marvel had this thing with the Electric Company mm -hmm. TV show with Spider Man, and we get those. But I remember lots of those obscure comics. Like uh, I remember this something about a Moomba, the petrified tree. There was this god lived inside a petrified tree. A guy came along and somehow let loose the the god inside the tree and he was, the tree was killing people, you know, stuff like that. I remember Dracula and another interesting story, you know, like the Zach story was, I remember having a Dracula in the late seventies and I remember it, Dracula picking up a barbell and throwing it at a weightlifter and the, or the weightlifter throwing the barbell at Dracula and Dracula catching it in one hand and it was 200 pounds. And I remember that sticking out in my head, but the anchor on that was Tom Palmer. And then I ended up getting in the business, you know, I don't know how many years later that was. Mm -hmm. The first guy I worked with was Tom Palmer. So, oh, nice. Yeah, so those things are little anecdotes, you know, that mm -hmm. sort of thrill me that I, you know, that these people, I, you know, I encountered later. I ended up working with John Byrne as well. I, you know, I picked up Season of the Witch was the first comic that got me into it again. And, um and then I ended up working with John Byrne on Hulk, you know, so pretty okay. cool. Who, uh, who is like probably your top three favorite artists that are currently working in the industry right now? Three favorite artists. Yeah. They're currently working. Yeah. Um, or who stands out the most to you, I should say. Jeez. Clay Mans jumps out at me. Clay Mans. Yeah. Stuff is jumping out at me. Um, Frank Quitely. Okay. So many. It's so hard to say, Frank. There's a lot of good talent out there. Yeah, I mean, there's so many good good people now. Um, uh, just so many. I mean, I could run a list. I mean, but those three are great. Um, uh, and uh, who's this other guy um, that I see on Instagram all the time is just phenomenal. Lee Weeks is phenomenal. Steve mm -hmm. You know, all, the, all these guys who I, I, I'm friends with, you know, friends yeah. with all these guys, except Frank Quayle, I don't really know too well. But, uh, yeah, I, I try to I try to be friends with artists who really inspire me to push myself further, you know. Yeah. Uh, I definitely try to do that. So uh, I think yeah, you know, there's, that's what's great about Instagram, you know, is mm -hmm. uh, access to all these guys instantly. Um, a lot of times, uh, you know, being being in comics, um, you don't get the access to the to the comic book, so I can see what people are working on you yeah. know, just by going on, um, you know, on Instagram or whatever, and then showing my stuff on there. Yeah, and this is uh, you know your Instagram page. If anybody wants to follow you, it's Ryan Garney Art. Ron. Instagram. Ron Garney Art. Sorry. I, <laughs> gosh, I'm looking at the Y. Is the A? Oh yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Ron. My bad. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you have a lot of cool sketches. You can see how I play around with styles. If you look at that surfer piece next to the oh, yeah. mm -hmm. green sketch, they're vastly different. Yeah. I always try to go with a feel for each character. Like the surfer is slick and steely and, and you know, very meticulous. Um, kind of like even the character's personality is very steely and alien and you know whereas the wolverine is rough and and uh, you know lots of cool rendered lines to it because of his personality so yeah. i'm trying to inject that stuff into the work based on the character 
That cover of Savage Sword, by the way, is my favorite. Thank uh, you. I reordered the book, the second printing, just to have that cover. Oh, really? Yeah. I was like, oh, I got to have it. So What's awesome about that is they're reprinting it in black and white. The whole book? Yeah. If you look on there, it says present oh. stunning black and white. So um, in October. Okay. Both gotcha. five issues is going to be collected in that one, in one big thing that's just in black and white. So I'm really excited about that because, like I was telling you before, sometimes when I do the penciling, I leave stuff out deliberately that the coloring will, you know, will fill in that I don't want filled in in the black and white. But it's obvious, you know, that's fine. I mean, the mm -hmm. colors an awesome job. I love it. But this will show like things that make it really interesting. Dude, I'll be buying that one for sure. <laughs> uh, Travis Gibb, who's a, a great writer, independent comic guy, uh, he asks, uh, Travis. What, Travis Gibb. Yep. Yes, uh, what writer has been the best to work with for your career? <laughs> you guys. Uh, geez, I love working with a lot of them, all of them. Well, I have some that I had some issues with, but um, they're all great people. Um, I will say that certain scripts are or uh, you have to adjust to more than others. I can't say anything about working with them personally. I honestly don't have a real close working relationship with the writers per se. I mean, I, it's not like we talk every day, you know, I tend to get the scripts, I read them through and then I put down what I, how, how I interpret them. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes I change things, but for the most part I try to be faithful and add to what, what they have there out of respect for them. Um, you know, there was a period of time where guys were doing work over writers and they would just leave out the things the writers were putting in. And that's just, you can't do that, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But uh, all, all these guys are great. I just got finished my run with Jerry Duggan on Conan. I love working with that guy. Mm -hmm. I like the way he writes the scripts. He's a very nice person. Um, you know. Uh, how, is, how is he when he writes the scripts? Is he very detailed when he does it? Or is he you just let you have a broad brush when you do your artwork. He have a broad brush. He would keep it pretty open, and it, it, and he wouldn't go too far into a lot of panels, because that you know if it gets more than five, it starts to become difficult. Because what people don't realize is you're working on something that's ultimately going to be this big. You know, mm -hmm. and, um, you have to really get in there in the detail and things like that, and and it's my job to make it impressive visually. And the more it gets that gets put on there in terms of dialogue and you know boxes and rhetoric and whatever um it gets more and more difficult to, to pull off something that's visually going to make you go wow you know so he left me a lot of room to keep it open and larger and um do some good clean clear large storytelling which i appreciate um they're all good i mean charles was great i love charles's charles sewell his um he had very unique ideas, like, and, and you know, that hadn't been done before for Daredevils, which I appreciated. So I was into that, into it, his writing for that reason. Um, you know, uh, I worked with Jason Aaron for a long time on stuff. Um, I love his writing. He's good. Yeah, yeah he's, he's good. Um, you know, there's so many guys going so far back all the way to, the beginning of my career, Mark Wade to Terry Cavanaugh to Howard Mackey to you know, you know they've all all been great. Dan Chai, Chester, they're all they're all great for their own reasons. So, but I've and I've enjoyed them. It's always been a learning experience for me, and a challenge to adjust to each one. And I think because of that, it's allowed my work to keep, you know, evolving too. You know, so um, so it's been good. Uh, Mutt Man would like to know, or he has a statement, your Hulk had a tremendous energy to it. I've always wanted to see you return to that character. Any interest in doing future Hulk stories? Yeah, I would love to do another Hulk, sto Hulk, 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 Hulk story. Um, I don't know when, if how, or, or you know, if it'll ever happen, or when it would ever happen, or, or what have you, but I, I, I am always about drawing a big, giant, green monster. So <laughs> um, when I first was offered Hulk, I was like, yes, 
I'd love to drive a hauler cruise. Yeah. Have you ever done Swamp Thing? Never. Well, I I, I did them, uh, not Swamp Thing, but Man Thing. In the oh, okay. Hulk. It was in a couple issues of the Hulk, I think. Um, but that's it. But no, I haven't done Swamp That DC is Swamp Thing. Yeah, no. Yeah. Uh, I've only been with D. I was only with DC for a couple of years, and I've been under contract with Marvel. You know, every few years, my contract. You know, we renegotiate. Oh, so you have an exclusive deal with yeah. Marvel right now? Oh, gotcha. Uh, how's ex- how's an exclusive deal work? Actually, can you give us a little bit of insight about how that works? It well, it's it's kind of like a sports contract, really. You know, you negotiate a deal that's exclusive to you. You know. Uh, you know, based on what you're, you know, what you've done and your qualifications and your mm-hmm. work you just finished doing and uh, your value. Basically, you have to negotiate your value, um, you know, and be realistic about it. You know, I, I, I always know when not to go for too much, you know, because I try to keep a good sense about what my value is and then have proof to back up what I think my value is, you know, and then present that in my negotiations, um, whether it be fan base or sales or, or what have you. Um, so you have to be a businessman about yourself and um, not be afraid to ask for, for what you think you deserve, but also not be afraid to stop yourself from asking for too much. Okay. Because, you know, at the end of the day, they should be, happy and you should be happy and you meet in the middle and okay, this is what, where we're willing to go with it. Gotcha. So, um, that's basically how it works. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so, and be reliable. I would say that your biggest advantage and a- attribute you should have is reliability and dependability um, and produce the work and produce it on time if you can and be good. Um, you have, there's ways around, making sure that you get the work done on time. Um, but I struggled a lot with that in the beginning of my career, and it's through experience that I learned because you know, there were periods where I was getting, you know, the editors were up my rear end, for lack of a better term, mm-hmm. trying to, you know, get the stuff done. And yeah, and so it would make my work suffer, and I had to really come to terms with what I wanted to present to the fans versus what I would present to the editors. Because um, the editors, they're under pressure as well and so you're as well as responsible for taking care of their pressure in addition to your own in addition to the anchors press you know you're responsible for making everybody get their stuff in on time including the editor yeah. you know, it's the editor's job you're i'm actually responsible for making sure the editor gets his stuff done you know so um it's a lot of pressure and you have to learn how to how to surf that so um you know, you've, you have to make a choice on what you want to be and not take on too much or more than you can handle and be realistic about it and be able to say no to them and say, look, I can't do this in this amount of time. Gotcha. And, and that's one of the reasons why the industry has gone towards arcs, you know, creative teams that are in arcs because it keeps it going and it takes the pressure off. And I'm grateful for that. Ultimately, I used to be more like, Oh, I really want, you know, just to stay on a regular book and be there every month, every month, every month, every month. But that's, you know, your work is going to suffer. I don't care who you yeah. are. Ultimately, I agree. It's going to suffer. And I would rather take, you know, do a five issue arc, yeah. take two issues off and be able to breathe and keep doing the quality that I want to do. Some guys are faster than others. I, you know, I don't know how, you know, there's guys like uh, John Romita Jr., for instance, who can, you know, just muscle that stuff out. I'm I'm fast enough and I can get stuff done, but he's, you know. What, what does it take me to pencil the link a page a day? Or is it a day, two days? Depends on what's on the page. Okay, gotcha. It can take me four hours. Sometimes it takes me a couple of days, you know. Mm-hmm. So just it's in that range, but it's always within a day or two. You know? Okay. I tend to work in mass. Like I'll go through and I'll pencil the whole book like do the layouts of the whole book so I can get a feeling of momentum and rhythm. Mm-hmm. And once I've done that, I don't have to sweat going to each page and trying to figure out how I'm going to draw it. And then I go back and I start from the beginning and then I do a bit and then I jump ahead when I get stuck 
because every time I get stuck, I, I it eats up time me trying to figure it out, and I can't figure it out unless I leave it. So I go ahead and I start working on other pages, and then I go back, and then usually what I couldn't figure out will jump out at me when I look right at the work. Yeah. Like, oh, that's why that that hand is too big. But you, sometimes you're so close to it, you can't see it, and you're trying to figure out what it is. And then you figure it out later because you go back and you boom, it just jumps out at you. So it's easier that way. Now, when you when you lay out your whole book at once, right? So uh, I tend to do that with you know my book, The Handyman, that I'm working on right now. I had it laid out all at once, but I stapled the edges together to make it look like a book to read through, so I could figure out where I needed, you know. Do you do that at all, or I, I've seen a couple of people? I don't do staple that. anything together, but I will. You know, I will, you know, I used to put out maybe six pages on my big table and mm -hmm. lay them all out so I could see it ahead. You know, I know lots of guys do that. Chris Pachalo, I think, does it that way. You know, so you can see all the images. Gotcha. I've wanted to meet him. I've never got to meet him. He's a good dude. I've only met him once. I don't really know him. Mm. I like his artwork, though. I like his artwork. Yeah, yeah, he's great. Uh, Travis was asking, "How did uh, Men of uh, Men of Wrath come about?" Men of Wrath. Wrath. Sorry. <laughs> that was I'm, that was drawn by Ryan Garney. Okay, I am a slightly dyslexic, which is why I read comics. So. <laughs> um, good. That that's actually a good name for town, Men of Wrath, like the Wraiths of, of Wrath or something. Um. Men of Wrath came out because Jason um, approached me, Jason Aaron, mm -hmm. me with the idea of doing a creator own, um, sort, of like, sort of like a Cormac McCarthy um, feel to it, um, set in the South. And I had always wanted to do, I had mentioned to him in the past, I think maybe, I mean, um, that I wanted to do something that wasn't hero related. Okay. Hero. Because I always liked Road to Perdition, mm -hmm. books like that, um, and they made a movie about it. That that's sort of a retro gangster uh, movie and uh, story. And so I wanted to do a real world uh, story. And so this was sort of along those lines, you know, true detective crime story. Um, and so that's what I was attracted to. I wanted to get away from the heroes for a bit and uh, dig my teeth into something really hardcore hard-boiled you know uh story so that's what that's sort of what prompted it and i read it what jason had come up with the initial draft and i i was gonna turn it down because it's it was almost too hardcore for me but then i said well you know, um you know for me to be a true artist i need to look at it that way and be honest about look this brutality in the face and that's the only way I could really truly call myself, you know, an artist if I were going to draw it, is to look it in the face and accept what's ha the violence that's happening within those pages mm -hmm. as part of the art, you know. And once I was able to wrap my head around it, I mean, maybe, you know, it was my way of justifying me drawing it, I guess. Okay. Yeah, with handy, so with my book, Handyman, it's the first time I've ever gone truly – to the dark side, you know, in my, in my brain and, you know, with the violence that we're doing in the book, but uh, we try to have meaning behind it so we can, I, I, I can keep doing it because it was just senseless violence to me. Uh, it's well, not really worth it. My book, Handyman, so. No, I don't like anything that's gratuitous. I was always yeah. a big uh, vocal guy about stuff like that. I don't know, sexually, I don't. Same thing, yeah. Any of that stuff. It needs to be within a context that's, you know that uh, there's a reason for it and there needs to be emotional impact and some sort of relevance to answer something i mean other than that because if it's not then it's it, it's just becomes pushing violence for violence sake is is i don't you know well that's all i can say about it it's just for its own sake and it doesn't really make you give you room to think about anything other than that you know i mean it's like yeah. kind of like watching at least even if i watch a david attenborough nature film about you know a polar bear eating a deal or something that's you know there's something 
in the context of nature but when you're just deliberately pushing that because it gets you off then that to me is pointless yeah i agree that's why we're good because uh, <laughs> but man was asking uh, again with another good question. Uh, do you, what, do you have a, what's the secret to having a long, successful career in comics? But I think you kind of went over that with being punctual with your work. Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I would say that of being visible, um, accessible, um, always, always answer the calls that come in. Mm -hmm. you know, um, don't play games. With editors and the editors shouldn't play games with the creators. What about, so. what about your relationship with customers and fans? Because I know that's kind of been a big topic off and on for the last year or two years with some oh. artists and writers and stuff like that not liking some of the criticism and being blocked, like on Twitter and stuff like that. I mean, I know you don't block anybody as far as I can tell, you know. Block but, anybody for what? Oh, I mean, comments concerns or well, I, I will be the first to admit i'll mute people if it's stuff that the politics correct yeah mm -hmm. i just don't want to i don't want to read it because especially now the crazy stuff that's going on now i mean i just mm -hmm. you know i have my beliefs that guide me through life um and i imagine everybody has theirs and i don't try not to judge people for theirs but I see a lot of people making really judgmental comments towards people for their beliefs. Yeah. That's completely stepping over the boundary, in my opinion, to inappropriate. Mm -hmm. So there's times I've muted people. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm not saying I don't like them or, you know, but I don't want to read it. You know, yeah, so I get you. I'll, I'll mute them or, or you know, um, if I feel like, and then, you know, I'll unmute them. I, you know, I just don't want to deal with that. That's not what I got into comics for. I try to keep the social media for my career and mm -hmm. my belief system, what I think should happen with the country or, or between people is what I vote for. And that's what the voting process is about. And, you know, and if I wanted to uh, venture down the road of an opinion, you know, where I want my opinions out there, I'll start a blog or something. Mm -hmm. But I just don't like the way everybody's firing at each other, you know, um, and judging, making judgments. Oh, yeah. Snap judgments on 140 characters is stupid. I, just, yeah. I don't believe in it. Yeah. I mean, it's hard not to. Sometimes I've had to bite my tongue because I see things people say or do or, you know, or I want to get in there. But at the end of the day, it's there's no point to it because mm -hmm. it's not going to change somebody's mind. You know, most of the time there's been studies done that – the more you argue with the person, the more set in stone their mind becomes about their point of view. Mm -hmm. So people in my, in my experience in life, we, we learn by doing, um, and you can all, your mind will change on its own through your own personal experiences. So mm -hmm. I just leave it be. All right. Good. Well, it's a wise, very wise thing to do. Uh, yeah. I just seen a lot of other, people over the last couple of years, especially when I was working at my comic shop, you know, trying to reach out to people, things like that, you know, different artists, uh, you know, like yourself for questions or, or things like that. And just get instantly like, I have no problem answering yeah. people's questions. Yeah. I, you know, um, I'm happy to, I like talking to the fans. I love the fans. Yeah, they do. I mean, they're, they're just the nicest people. And they always say the nicest things, even if, you know, and I, I wish I could follow everybody back, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I'm telling everybody out there now that, you know, I'm sorry, I can't, you know, but, and I can't answer all the mail I get all the time because I get tons, you know, and it's, but I appreciate all of them, all of you, you guys, um, and for sincerely do. I mean, you know, I, what other job, not too many vocations a person can have where you know they do the work and people tell you how much they love your work mm -hmm. and then there's people who are your detractors i remember uh one guy on a on a message board his name was the anti garney and this <laughs> <I> just, <laughs> this guy hated my work just hate me. and it's funny because they hate your work so by extension of that they hate you they yeah. just that you personally are a dick for a, a <laughs> assaulting their senses with your horrible, you know, uh, 
eye gouging horror show of artwork that you present to them. <laughs> so I mean, I, I gotta say, I got a kick out of it. Made, made me, makes me laugh. So I even appreciate that. You know, some guys get on your nerves. It's usually the guys who make blanket statements about your work as if they're the final word on whether it's good or not, you know, and not give any credence to somebody else's opinion. Yeah. That might be. Nobody's, you know, everybody's got sort of their view on how it impacts them. And I get that, you know, but yours is not the final word on it. Yeah. It, it seems like kind of society's gone, kind of gone that way lately. It's just about me, me, me only my feelings and not that's because, yeah, that's not to interrupt, but that's because no, you're fine. it's because of the last 20 years of seeing your words put on a screen. Yep. You know, it's caused people to become more narcissistic than ever where they're, they think the world is revolving around their opinions. Everybody becomes the master of their own universe on the internet. Yep. You know? And so we all become, you know, uh, in love with what we're saying. And, uh, you know, and that can be a good thing. It can be, it, it, there's downsides to everything. Um, there's good sides to everything. And it's great to be able to have access to people access to opinions about your work, access to the nice compliments, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, access to people is a good thing, but like anything else, it can go down a corrupt road where it can, things can corrupt people if you're not careful. And you have to always stay grounded. Uh, if I would say anything to people, stay grounded, you know, and um, don't let your, don't let things run away with, and don't let yourself run away with yourself. Yeah, I agree. I shall agree. Uh, Jess has a couple of other questions here real quick. Uh, what do other artists get wrong about drawing Conan? <laughs> I love these questions. Hey, I love my people. A lot right? of these questions, you guys, are funny because they're all sort of designed for me to give my opinion on other people's creativity. Correct, yeah. You know, I, I don't know what you want me to say. Well, you know, Mahmoud Arsar draws Conan's nose too big you know or something <laughs> i'm gonna say that yeah uh, you know i try to you know honestly just draw a big nose though <laughs> I, I don't know i would just do that yeah we're still i, mean, I love mahmoud asra he's one oh, of the great dude, yeah. he actually emailed me this weekend so we're actually working out time so he can come on too so oh, yeah, yeah. so awesome. yeah uh, so yeah so i mean i what do they get wrong about it? i'm not i i would tell you what they get right about it more than anything Mm -hmm. I, and if I were to say anything I've seen in the past, I won't say any artist because I don't even, can't remember who they are. But I've seen guys draw him, I think, too big. You know, a lot of these guys that you see in comics would have to be on twenty years of steroids to be the same. <laughs> yeah, if you're in a Hyborian age where access to food and everything else, unless you're some kind of genetic, complete genetic anomaly freak. You're not going to be, you know, like a, a Mr. Olympia running yeah. around swinging a sword just for the fact that one, your body for a guy like Conan's height would be a little not so mesomorphic because the guys who tend to be muscle muscular naturally are shorter guys because they're mesomorphic. Guys who are long and tall tend to be a little more ectomorphic. So a guy like Conan is living in, a, you know, an era where it's, you know, he's running around and battling it. He's going to be burning off a lot of muscle and fat. So he's yeah. not going to be, I try to look at things semi, it's cool to look at. Yeah. But I, I try to be a little bit more believable. About oh yeah. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. Cause I remember I mean, yeah. say I've been drawing guys too big. I have, <laughs> Conan, Hulk, you know, it's the Hulk, so. Conan number one for Marvel. If you look at it back in the day, he was so skinny back then to where he's with the way he's drawn now. It's kind of crazy. So yeah, he, he, yeah, he had to be on steroids or something. He's skinny now compared to what he was back then. No, no. In the first one, he was a lot skinnier. Yeah, yeah. So well, I think John Buscema drew him correctly. You know, mm -hmm. but John Buscema drew everybody correctly. <laughs> uh, gotcha. So there's just. You know, it all depends on your – no interpretation is wrong. Let, let me just say that. I mean, if you have your particular vision of what you want Conan to be, that's just as legit as anybody. My interpretation is that's, you know, that's not how I would draw him. But 
anybody's interpretation is, is legit. So it doesn't exist. So anybody's interpretation is legit. Uh, just also asked, uh, when's the wrong Ghani Brad Ashworth collab coming? Uh, <laughs> uh, in, what, in what genre? Yeah, well, well I don't know. We're going to do a first Brad and Ron, Betty and Veronica. Oh, there we go. Yeah, that'll sell well. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, let's see. Uh, Mutt Man was saying, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, hey, how should a comic artist stay healthy and balanced, by the way? That was a good question. I was going to bring it up because I know you do uh, jiu-jitsu, right? Brazilian jiu-jitsu? Yeah, yeah, I, I owned a jiu-jitsu school. Um, yeah, I teach. I've taught. I don't teach as much anymore because I'm, I've had a few operations. I had a shoulder operation mm -hmm. and knees and stuff, so. I still train, but I had a school for a number of years and um, I love doing it. I love it, you know, mm -hmm. competed in tournaments, and, you know, but I'm older now. I mean, I'm, you know, 56, so it's my body doesn't want to do what I want it to do as much. Um, my brain is still 30. Yeah. Physically, I want, I could get excited, but I can't do it as much. But what was the question? I mean, so, how should artists, you know, keep themselves? you know, healthy and, oh, uh, right. you know, uh, yeah, balanced, you know, sure. I mean, because you, you're sitting all the time, you really have to get up and move around. I try to get up every hour and at least move around, but I exercise, you know, and I try to stay healthy and eat right. As you get older, the eating becomes paramount and staying in shape becomes paramount. And, you know, don't put your body through the stresses that you put it under when you're younger. You know, I was younger and I was lifting weights. I was really into, you know, at one point bodybuilding and lifting weights for years and I got really strong and, and I damaged my shoulders because of it, and, you know. Um, so I would say, I don't know how old most of you guys are, but um, pace yourself and don't overdo it. Everything, yeah. everything in moderation. There's real wisdom to that. It's true. When you're younger, you're, you know, you, you're, you think you're a world beater, you know. And even in jiu-jitsu, I thought I was a world beater. I want, you know, I wanted to prove uh, to myself or, or whatever. It's fun. I don't even know that proving anything myself, but it was just fun to do. And you want to be a world beater. And that comes with a price. Everything comes at a price. So, um, you know, you live by the sword and die by it. So, you know, go easy. But exercise and stay in shape and, um, you know, and live a good life. You know, live a good lifestyle. This can be a lot of fun, but if you let yourself sit too long, and get out of shape, and let it get to you, um, you'll fun. emotionally and mentally break down yep. because this can be a lot of pressure. Yep. And as fun as it is, there's a lot of pressure to doing this um, as a career because it's competitive, it's stressful for, for the time consumption. Um, if you're trying to raise a family and you've got deadlines, it's very difficult to meet the demands of deadlines and have a family and people that require your attention. So you really have to keep yourself in order like any career. So, yep. Yeah. So like I've been, you know, out of shape for a long time. You know, I am, I'm a really large dude. So like I've been, I've been doing a lifestyle change. You have been? Yeah. So like the last couple of weeks, like I've changed my diet completely. Uh, I've been, yeah. You know, more active, walking, because I got a park right across the street now. And I've noticed changes starting to take place, you know. So I totally agree with you there. You've got to have that change. I would suggest try to go to jiu-jitsu. You want to get in shape fast. You want to shed pounds or do whatever. Man, I'll tell you, that will get you in shape. I mean, you know, I was really into lifting weights and bodybuilding at first, and I got bored with that. And I was doing the jiu-jitsu, and the more I did it, the weight would just shed off me. Mm -hmm. like, because it's one of the most uh it'll get you in shape one of the quickest besides running you know i mean then you're learning something it's like a chess match you know how to submit somebody you know because jujitsu is uh it's about submission holds and uh, leverage holds and mm -hmm. breaking limbs you know using someone's own if someone who's bigger and stronger using their leverage uh against them using your body weight on, on a joint to, to break or snap or choke them unconscious, you know. Um, so it's fun. I mean, you know, it's fun to learn those things and to know how to defend yourself even, you yeah. know. Can't express, you know, stress that enough to people. 
I saw Peter Palmiotti jumped on. Hey, Peter. I know, yeah. Peter's a good friend of mine too. He's a he's a good guy. Uh, one last question for before we wrap this up. Uh, I want to give Nick W the question. Does Ron plan on launching any crowdfunding comic series coming up? Uh, you know, I've seen the success a lot of these guys have, and if I'm going to do that, I want to do it not just because it's a big money, you know, like, oh, I can get money, you know, Good. because I think that's what a lot of people do it for. It's like free money to them, and, I, and I'm not going to use it for that. I want to, If I'm going to use it, it's because – there's something I want to put out there and it's the best avenue for me to go to get it done and, and get the support, you know, mm -hmm. I think most guys would do it for that reason. But I've seen a couple of questionable um, fundraisers for, you know, some things that I don't think it's appropriate in my opinion. So mm -hmm. don't ask me who I'm not going to ask you. Don't worry. <laughs> or what? But I've seen a couple of things. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would do it, and I would hope it would have a, you know, I would, I would get the support I'd be looking for. You know, I've seen, you know, I mean, look at Ethan Van Skyver. What did he make? Like, oh, he's pushing eight hundred thousand right now. That's insane. Yeah. Yeah. And today, yeah. He, as long as he gives back, he gives it back. You know, um, in in his product. Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, Doug Tenapel, I was just telling you about that one today. You got forty thousand the first hour. That was crazy. So, Pretty great, man. You know, yeah, I, if I did it, I would, you know, hopefully I would be able to you know, I know in my luck I would put it on there in the first six weeks I'd get like two hundred bucks. <laughs> <laughs> no, I no, I don't think so. You you get two hundred bucks just for me, so you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dad, I'm just gonna start a crowd and you're the only one who's allowed to donate. <laughs> oh, okay. Good to know. <laughs> Well, hey, uh, Ron, and uh, you know, people in the chat, uh, it's been a fun. I think it's been a good conversation for the last hour and a half. And yeah, I, I really enjoyed your guys' questions. Um, I see other questions, so I'm sorry if I couldn't get to all of them. But um, I think we got most of them, though, or we went over a lot of everything. So my drawing environment, real quick. Uh, drawing environment's important. Um, I like having things that inspire me you know the internet's even great for that um comics posters on the wall my kids drawings inspire me uh real quick um what do i focus on other artists do <laughs> we already went down that road yeah uh, funny. okay yeah it looks like looks like we got to a lot of them yeah yeah we did so well, i want to thank i want to thank you for being with me ron uh honestly my pleasure I'm sorry that you guys don't want to take you up on it because it's to me it's fun to connect with all the fans and stuff. So yeah, and then, you know maybe we'll have you on again in the future. And if you ever got a product you want to shill, you know, let me know. For sure, man. For yeah, sure. dude. I'll let you know what's happening. Yeah, no worries. Hang out for a minute. I'm just gonna end the broadcast. Oh, real quick, how do they get a hold of you if they want to get a hold of you? Probably on my social media, on Instagram. Uh, uh, which I did put both in the description, by the way, down below, so you can click okay. on it and go right to the stuff. Probably the easiest way. Um, Instagram, you can at least, I think you can email people on that. I have like 100 mails. I haven't mm -hmm. got private messages, but it's hard because a lot of those are from girls just saying hi. <laughs> yeah, this, this, this fake, uh, yeah, oh, yes. those Instagram girls, yeah. So, But, um, you know that, or you can email me at yenrag at aol .com. I'll try to get to them, but I get again, I like literally, like from yesterday, I had I deleted most of my mails. I got down to two fifty, and they jumped up to over six hundred in a day. <laughs> Damn, dude! And I keep trying to get rid of the, you know, and they unsubscribe to some of these things that just automatically attack. So it's, you know, I try to get to them if I if I can. Cool. And I want to thank uh, people in chat, Muttman, Peter, uh, Nick, Jess Smiley, yes. Mighty Geek. Yeah, you guys man. are all awesome, dude. You guys are all awesome. Thank you guys, you're awesome. Pete, yeah. see you around, buddy. Sorry I couldn't get to you earlier. All right. Well, thanks, guys, for hanging out. You can get, reach me at Pencil for Life on Twitter, uh, YouTube, or Instagram. And uh, good luck. God bless. Talk to you next time. Take care. <laughs>